Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Jane the Virgin, Season 1, Episode 22, Chapter 22. In this episode, Jane finally gives birth to a boy, as anybody who happened to see the thumbnails already knew. And, uh, you guys, the episode ends with her baby being stolen. And I really did not see that one coming. Oh my god. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Claire for commissioning this episode. And apologies, Claire, for starting late today. I watched One Piece instead of Jane the Virgin by accident, and I wound up having to start late. Um, Hi to April, who is in the chat with me. Thank you for coming, April. So, God, this episode is so packed, you guys. I don't even know. So, let's let's just, I'm going to go, like, mostly scene by scene here. Oh my god, I forgot my headphones are not plugged in. I just put them on. <laughs> Oops. So let's get popping. That's how I should be starting my episodes off. What am I doing? Let me take a nod from the narrator about the Yinwella babies. So we get a flashback to when Jamara is giving birth. And you guys, I don't feel like I fully appreciated just how much the actress they got for young Shamara looks like older Shamara until this episode. Yo, she looks so much like her. It's crazy. Their casting is truly something to behold. These people know what they're doing. She is so goddamn close. So she gets a pep talk from her mom, despite being exhausted and manages to push through her labor, even (laughs) pun intended. And uh, then we have her and her mom, you know, just kind of, uh, bonding after the birth and her telling her mother that she named her Jane. When we come to the present, Jane is uh, making grilled cheese sandwich as she is wont to do. And her mother is fretting because she has to go to Vegas for this thing. And she doesn't want to miss the birth, but she also wants to fulfill her obligation. And we get an amazing moment. I would love a, a show of hands. How many of you all thought Jane was really going into labor here? Because I definitely fell for it. 100%. When she starts laughing, I got so... I was just as mad as her mom. I was just like, I can't believe you would do that to me, ma'am. And she was so convincing. Like, oh, I mean, that got to me. Um, But it's kind of fun because we start off, like, with that... And we get another fake out with the Braxton Hicks contractions. And so we have like two fake outs and it makes sense why, like by the third one, we're sort of like, yeah, probably not. Right. Not this time either. But the whole thing with her, this episode is everybody being on edge and her being certain there's no, there's no concern because she has, I think three weeks left until her due date or something like that. It's long enough that I can understand her feeling pretty complacent about things as well. Um, So let me go back to Raphael, who's talking with his sister. And we find out that, you know, he (laughs) he's getting good advice from Louisa, who is basically taking the position that I did where, yeah, of course, Jane is saying it's good that you broke up with her when you did because she thinks you don't love her. And she's operating with, like, wrong information. And we have a flashback of a really cute moment between her and Raphael where they're theorizing about how hair, how much hair the baby has. Because apparently you can see hair in the scans, which I didn't know. Um, but then he goes to, like, take a picture with her, a selfie, and the, you know, screen is facing them for this. And Petra starts calling, and it just, like, 
pops up on the screen in the moment and it's just the absolute worst timing not only for Petra to literally be kind of like coming between them but also it's definitely going to be about work and here he is trying to have this moment with Jane and work is once again getting in the way and it just feels like everything that Jane was concerned about is totally valid due to this little thing you know um and it turns out that the Marikade group was sold and there's money going to like be coming in and he is planning to buy Petra out. What he's wanting is to convince her via manipulation to let him buy her out. And he doesn't know that she overheard him talking to Louisa. So once, you know, once he, once that moment happens, I, I, she is going to play him so hard. It's going to be awful, you guys. I don't even know. <sighs> I'm not looking forward to this because, like, Raphael was good at manipulating her in a complete vacuum. But now that she knows, I do not see him outmaneuvering her. I just don't see it. The only way that happens is if he fully manages to get Jane on board. And the only way Jane gets fully on board is if there is a damn good reason, because just trying to get shares from Petra and, you know, manipulating her for that, I don't feel like that's going to be a good enough reason. Jane's not going to want to support that. It's going to feel like petty and gross. It's a different thing when she's you know, manipulating Petra for justice because her mother is about to skate on an attempted murder. That's a very different situation. But I just don't feel like this is going to be strong enough for her to want to get involved. Also, Jane's going to be a little bit fucking distracted by the fact that her fucking child has been stolen. But we will get there. Holy shit, you guys, I swear. Um, so we go to Rogelio, who is getting very excited for his... Uh, trip to Vegas and his show. I am going to just tell the Rogelio and Shamara story here like I tend to do. So I loved it so much, you guys, because I was having the same reaction as Rogelio. Shamara had told Jane, anything goes on that you think you're in labor, let me know. I will literally be on the next flight out. And she gets word that Jane is going into labor and she tries to book a flight that day but there's nothing until the following morning like really early so she gets off the phone after like booking this very unsatisfactory flight and she goes up to Rogelio with this expression on her face and he's like what's wrong and she explains that Jane's going into labor so she's going to have to leave I'm so sorry I'm sure me leaving won't affect the act that much and he gets this like are you fucking kidding look on his face and walks away and in the moment it happened, I was surprised that she doesn't say, are you going to want to come with me? She doesn't expect him to at all. She's just like, of course, I will leave and you won't. Which I was like, Rahelia was so involved and devoted to Jane. Of course, he's going to want to be there. Like, it's weird that she's not asking. And then he reacted with such anger. But I wasn't picking up that it was because of my train of thought as well. I thought he genuinely was like, I can't believe that you're leaving me high and dry. And I was like, wait, is that what we're doing? Are we going to have Rahelio be pissed at her? I can't say I'm going to buy that, but I maybe it could be misplaced anger because he still cares about her and they've broken up. And then it turns out it, it was exactly because he was thinking the same thing as me. Like you didn't even consider that I would want to be there. It just didn't even seem to enter your mind. And of course she has a really good reason to think this is like a major program that he has been working on personally to get himself in the sights of this director that he is crazy about. Like this is a very, he actually, this is showing a little bit of where Jane gets it from considering that Shamara is not this way. Rogelio, I think, might be the, like, orderly planner of the two of them. But he really has devoted a lot of his time and energy 
into creating this show. So she, of course, believes that this is going to be first for him, you know, that he is going to want to at least get these shows out of the way the next couple of days and then he can come back. But no, he wants to be there for Jane and he is really hurt at the fact that Shamara doesn't consider him like enough of a member of the family that him joining her is like not a foregone conclusion. It should be a foregone conclusion that I'm coming to at this point. And if it's not, it means that I have not like integrated myself enough or you don't see me as integrated enough. And that sucks. So the two of them wind up uh, going to a bar and they're just about to leave after having like their heart to heart about things. And as they're leaving, they run into a bunch of Rogelio's fans from Venezuela. I think one of the girls says, and the next thing you know, they're both waking up really hungover. I thought they had missed their flight. That's what I thought was we were going to wake up and it was going to be like a home alone situation where they realize we slept in and then they start running around trying to, but they didn't miss their flight. She checks her phone. She's like, we've really got to hurry. And I was like, Oh word. Well, good for you. That's weird though. And they're both dressed. So it's pretty clear they didn't sleep with each other. I mean, I guess you could have slept with each other and still be like mostly dressed, but usually if you're drunk and fucking still mostly dressed, you don't redress after. And he, I, th I think they were both pretty much like all complete with pantyhose and belt and everything even. Um, so they get up and take their flight. And I think it's at the airport while they're waiting or on the plane. I can't even remember where, but they're going through a bag and they find a, uh, Rowan Zoe, <laughs> a CD labeled just Rowan Zoe, which is actually adorable. And they think each of them thinks it's the others. And they decide they're going to play it even though they don't know what it is, which I was very surprised. Like, I wouldn't be putting a CD that I randomly found in my luggage on my computer. I'm just not going to do it. I, I, I really would not, but it's fine. So they do it and it begins to play and it's the both of them in their outfits from the night before. And they're relieved that it's not a sex tape at first, but then they're like, what is happening? Because they see themselves walking down this aisle and there are some other drunk people there that we recognize as his fans from the night before. And it turns out the two of them got married while they were drunk. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that like in a lot of shows I would be going, well, you could just get a divorce. But the thing is that I don't know how much the Catholicism is at play for Zoe anymore. Uh, I will say that since Zoe had said she was not going to, she wasn't going to sleep with Rogelio until she had a ring on her finger. Uh, I guess she can now. She was already considering that the moving in together was enough of a commitment, but you know, now we're official. Um, I'm sorry guys. My dog is barking and I don't know what He's not usually a, a barker. Um, so I like the fact that they're married. And, and I also don't know how much of a role Catholicism plays with Rogelio. I actually am not sure how seriously he takes faith at all. I'm assuming that he's also Catholic, but I don't even know that much. I don't think. So, yeah, that's we're going into the second season with the two of them married. And I don't know if uh, they're going to be trying to get an annulment. I don't think they'll do divorce or if they are going to do divorce, then Alba would certainly have something to say about it. Um, but this is kind of a fun development. It's not something that's like of particular. I, I It's the sort of thing that I'm like, you could easily work around this in any way you need to. As much as we treat it like a crisis, how much of a crisis is it really? But I will be interested to see how it plays out for the two of them. So then let's talk about 
the way that Raphael is playing things with Petra, he is pretending to be distracted by her beauty while in a meeting with her. And he's very convincing. And uh, they wind up making a date to go to dinner. He invites her to Travaglio's. And I think that's the name of the place. It's an Italian place. That's where they went on their first date. And there is a hospital that keeps trying to get in touch with Rogelio. And he's getting really impatient because they're being interrupted by his assistant, Scott. And he keeps telling Scott to, like, handle it. And eventually what we find out is, I'm just going to jump ahead to this. We find out that Petra has taken it upon herself since he wouldn't answer her calls. Her being the woman from the hospital, not Petra's calls. She takes the phone up as Mrs. Solano, which is what sort of like gets her in the position to do what she does. She finds out that there was some sort of screw up in the storage of the semen samples and that there were two and one of them had been misplaced, but it had been recovered and they are super embarrassed and apologize. And what she does is goes down there and gets her fucking husband's ex-husband's sample for herself. I, do not know that she would have been allowed to do this if she were, if it were real life, even if she were married still, I'm not sure if he would have to personally sign off that she'd take custody of it or what, but I'm very willing to believe that an institution that fucked up as badly as this place did might not feel like it has the, the like upper hand in dictating what she's allowed to, and not allowed to do. And she could be like, I'm taking this with me. If you want to make an issue out of it, I will also file a lawsuit against you. So you can either shut the fuck up now and give it to me, or you can turn this into a whole big headache, which I will definitely win. And, uh, she walks away with this sample. And the thing is that Raphael has no idea that this sample even exists. I don't remember if there's a mention at the start of the episode or the start of the season about how there should have been two samples and there wasn't, if, if they knew that there should have been another one and that that was part of the like screw up, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that neither of them was aware. And even if they were, I'm not really sure how much it matters because I don't think Raphael would, would, expect her to be able to just go and take it. Um, So what I have to assume Petra's plan is here, either a, she is going to try and impregnate herself with his sample and then be like, ha, who, who's got a family now, bitch, which, um, I don't really see the advantage of. The thing is, and this is a really, this is the the weird gray area that you get into with stuff like this. If it were revealed eventually that they released this sample to her, no questions asked and didn't bother to find out that she wasn't even married to him anymore. If it were that she had like basically done this without his consent and trapping him in the most literal way. Would it hold up in court if she were trying to get anything out of him? Setting that aside, would it affect his conscience at all? Even if it were without his consent. To know that there's another kid with his DNA out there too. Like, maybe that would kind of... It it wouldn't matter the way that she went about it. It's his kid and that's all there is to it. But the the question that I ultimately come to is the Petra situation in the last se- in the earlier part of the season where she is like still just trying to get money out of him. 
she eventually has reached this point with her shares in the hotel where it doesn't seem like she needs the money from him anymore. It's she is in a comfortable financial situation, if I'm not mistaken. So this would purely be now about holding on to his affection. And I don't know if <laughs> this is, I always have this question though. So what she would be thinking here is I am going to hold on to this guy by having his child, which he neither agreed to me having or would be happy to hear I had. And I can't understand being someone who wants a relationship with a person that I am fully aware does not want me back. This is something that I, I'm, I'm saying with the full understanding that plenty of people operate on this and I don't get it with any of them, but I'm just acknowledging this is a very real thing. So I'm not trying to say like the writing is bad or anything like that. It's just the kind of like headspace that I do not get because for, for example, earlier today I was listening to a snapped episode and this woman who is sleeping with a married man decides to try and convince him not to leave her by telling him a, that she has cancer and B that she is pregnant with his child. And it turns out neither of those things is true. But what I kept thinking was, why would you want to be with somebody that you knew was with you only because of a fake situation and that if circumstances weren't what they appeared to be, they would take their first opportunity to leave you. Like, it just doesn't compute for me. And what was so funny was this woman's, she, the, the man she was sleeping with, his wife, turns up dead. And the police are interviewing her and she is sitting in her living room with her pregnant belly talking to the police and one of the cats jumps on her stomach and it just deflates because it's a pillow. This is real life, you guys. Can you imagine being one of these cops and seeing her stomach just cave in? I like she just got a pillow on under her shirt. I would never stop laughing. I cannot imagine the Benny Hill shit like what do you do? I mean, what do you do? She's like, she told the man that she was pregnant and then the, she did wind up, of course, being behind his wife's death and she couldn't even be bothered to invest in like a convincing pregnant belly. Come on, lady. If you are planning to keep this whole charade up for this dude's benefit, you're going to have to do a little bit better than that. Oh my God. And then, and then lying about being pregnant, like, what do you do when months pass and you're not showing? Like, you just try and get pregnant, I guess, and hope for the best. But they're not like, you know, nine months. That's very basic math. You're not even into double digits. I think they'll figure it out. Anyway, um, Rowan says, I assume she was down on the clinic's original paperwork and they didn't bother to take her off it because they didn't know about the second sample. Oh, no. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming as well. But I'm saying, like, likely you could get a suit for them not doing their due diligence to make sure they were still married and giving her custody of like, this is his tissue, you know? So I feel like they could probably have a pretty good case. Um, but maybe it was just giving permission to her by name and whether or not they were married wasn't part of like the deal. I don't know, but nevertheless, there's probably something a good lawyer could do. But anyway, so I, her plan is, is very fuzzy. There's another option here that is possible. And I almost think it's more likely my, my instinct is to go with her 
getting herself pregnant because if she's still in love with him and she thinks that having a family with Jane is what's coming between them, she can delude herself into if I have a family also, he will eventually be won over. Like maybe she's willing to take the risk that he will hate and resent her at first, but that she will be able to like worm her way in despite his better judgment. There's also the possibility that she could try and actually sleep with him and then use the sample to pretend that she got pregnant through that encounter. Like either actually sleep with him and use the sample if he were using protection and just try and claim, Oh, there was a hole in it or whatever. Or do what she did to him that one time where you get him drunk and drugged and then make him think you slept together when you didn't. And that could be a golden opportunity to use the sample and pretend that's how you got pregnant. And I guess that's probably more likely what she would do because just using it outright feels a little bit too much of an assault. He would never forgive her. And what she wants is him and his heart. And doing something like that, she'd never get it. So I'm going to say that would be her plan, is to trick him into thinking that he got her pregnant in the normal way. Do I know exactly... Like, you could just... You, you know, with using a sample like this, I'm trying to think how you would administer it. I guess just you could do something like a turkey baster or a syringe or something, and that would probably mostly do it. Um, but I am really, really worried because of how he has said that he cares about Jane and regrets breaking up with her, which Jane is not here for, by the way. And I kind of enjoyed her reaction. Um, if he thinks... Or if she thinks that he actually cheated on her with Petra, I don't see him coming back from that. Like, he ha she hasn't accepted him back. She hasn't said she wants a relationship with him. But if Petra wants to come between them, all she needs to do is get them both to think that they slept together. And that would be the door closing forever on Raphael and Jane, like for the foreseeable future. So yeah, I'm going to go with that. Um, now there's also the situation with Magda in prison. Now that she knows that Raphael has been manipulating her, does she try and get her mother out or does she, uh, decide to double down because she is going to trick him anyway and she needs to keep up appearances on her side of things. I feel like she'd have to keep up appearances. So Magda's not getting out of jail. Um, and yeah, the, the thing that her mother says when she visits her in jail is like, he has, he's having a baby with that woman. That is a bond that's never going to break. You aren't going to be able to beat that. And it gets her really thinking, especially once the big date they're supposed to have at Travoli's gets canceled because Jane is in labor. And it's really the first of many times that he would be putting his family first. And she is seeing the future a little bit here. So if she can have his baby, that's a bond that he can never break either. If she winds up actually getting pregnant, you guys... I have to assume she will. I'm going to make a prediction for next season that Petra becomes pregnant. I don't know what to think about that. Like, where do you go from there? What the fuck? I truly don't. I, I have no idea. Oh my God. So <laughs> it's really, especially considering how Jane was trying to get full custody so that the baby would have no contact with anybody involved with Sinrostro. 
And then the baby is literally abducted by Sinrostro. Could she be proved more right? Like, that's about as solid as it's going to get. I swear that's so unfair. Like, Rogelio or Raphael is, once they find out what's happening, he's going to feel really, really guilty. Like, yikes. Um, okay, so I pretty much covered everything with Petra. Uh, she goes to tell Raphael, like, with full intent of doing the right thing until she overhears that he has been playing her. And, you know, it's a little rich for her to be so offended by it when that's literally all she's ever done is try and play people. But it is what it is. So let's jump over to Jane now. So she got a rejection from the grad program because she was two days late on her submission due to everything that's been going on. And she tries to submit a letter to the admissions counselor. And she winds up getting an interview. This is the sort of thing that, like, it's often portrayed in media that you can appeal a decision. And it's often portrayed as, like, you can't give up. Show them how much you really want it by following up and demanding to talk to them about it. But if you've ever known an admissions counselor or been an admissions counselor, you know that this approach is by no means an exception. Like maybe not most people do this, but it's super common to follow up and be, try and be like, well, how, how serious was that? No, though, actually. And I always laugh when it's portrayed in television as evidence of you being a real go getter and that you have to win them over because you just want the thing so much and that your passion is going to jump right off the page. And when they meet you, they'll realize that you're really special and deserve to be here and they'll, you know, do what they can for you. And it's just like, actually how this comes across in life often is you are feeling really entitled and the, you can talk somebody out of the firm decision they made and already notified you about, and it actually doesn't look awesome for you. Like, you know what I mean? It, it's just the sort of thing when you go from fiction to life, certain things work really well in fiction that in life come across as incredibly pushy and egotistical and self-centered. So, I just really, uh, this whole bit with her, I was like, I get why the show is handling it this way. And I believe that Jane is the type to handle it this way as a character, but I do not think this would work out for her at all. And so what winds up happening is she's in the middle of talking to Michael about this email when she starts to have really strong contractions and she, he's the only one there. So he drives her in. And it turns out to be Braxton Hicks, which are basically like false contractions. And because they thought it was real labor, they called Raphael, who is also here. And he tries to dismiss Michael and be like, she's fine. You can go. I'll give her a ride home. And Michael says, I'm going to stay and say goodbye. And Raphael says, I'll tell her you said goodbye. You can go. And I have got to say, friends, out of the two of them in this scene, Raphael comes off by far the worst. First of all, you dumped her and now you're trying to block his access to her, despite the fact that you have no claim on her whatsoever anymore. So you already would have come off as a douchebag here, considering that he was there for her and drove her in. You should be thankful to him, but instead you're clearly resentful. And that's already a bad look. But secondly, this is so utterly none of your business, which both Michael and Jane say to him. But secondly, he says... Because Michael says, I'll wait. And he says, of course you were, because you're just always here waiting. 
aren't you? Hoping that she comes running back. And he basically tries to be like, you want her back? Just say it. And we saw the conversation Jane had with Michael last episode where she asks him if he's okay with this. And he admits in a perfect world, I would want it to be more, but if this is what you're comfortable with, I just want you in my life. So Raphael is taking a stance here of really aggressive assertion that Michael wants to be with Jane as if Michael is playing it innocent with everyone and in denial about his real motives when the only person whom his motives concern at all he had a very open and honest conversation with about it already and that's the thing with Raphael is that because he doesn't know about it or because he wasn't there for it the fact that this conversation all like already happened and the air is clear between them they know where they stand for the most part he's acting like michael is being really dishonest and and devious when actually out of the two of you michael's been the most honest with jane at this point after everything you know and it's just the the confrontation between them. It gets really ugly. Jane pops up and is just like, dude, what the fuck is with you guys? Uh, f- fine. I do want her back. Are you going to do something about it? Stop hiding behind your badge for five seconds and maybe I will. What does that mean? How is Michael hiding behind his badge? Like your hotel has been in the middle of an investigation, dude. And I know that's not your fault. But it's also not Michael's fault. He happened to be there already for his job. It's fine. Like, you're acting like he is pushing you around using his his job and, like, orders and stuff. I haven't seen him do that, really. I've seen him get kind of aggressive with, like, Raphael stonewalling him. Because Raphael does dig his heels in if Michael asks him to do anything out of principle because he doesn't like Michael. But that's just Raphael being really immature and uncooperative, which is not Michael's fault. So it's just like a sort of weird... He... (laughs) I love Michael saying, I'd be happy to kick your entitled ass emergency rooms right over there. And I was like, that's actually a pretty good line. But yeah, Jane pops up and just like, what is going on? And they both are trying to be like, I will let you, I will take you home. No, get a ride home with me. And she's like, are you seriously doing this right now? My grandma's near. I'm going to call her for a ride. And when Raphael says it's not necessary, she's like, it is because I don't want to be with either one of you right now. So she walks away. The two of them are left looking really like just frustrated with how things went. And then we get the apologies from each of them. So Raphael comes to her house that night and he finally just says, I've been waiting for the right time, but there is no right time or place. I made a mistake breaking up with you. I was in a dark place. My dad died. The hotel was falling apart and I couldn't handle that. And a relationship. I knew I was letting you down. So instead of fighting for you, I walked away and I shouldn't have done that. And she's freaking out. And he says, I wish I could take it back and make another decision. She says, you said you didn't love me. And he says, that wasn't true. I didn't think that I was good for you. And I thought that's what you needed to hear. But I do love you. Of course I love you. And you and this baby are all that matter to me. And she says... You broke my heart and now you're saying you didn't mean it and I should just pretend like this didn't happen. And honestly, this was not the reaction that I expected, but I really, really respect her stance here because I didn't consider the way it was going to sound when he just 
blurted out like i lied about not loving you anymore so that you would stay away from me because i thought i knew what was best for you it sounds bad and like it is bad but there's ways that you could have like made this you could have tried to spin it so that it was self-sacrificing somehow you know romantic and to his credit he doesn't really do that i'm not entirely sure if i should be giving him credit like if it was him trying to be as honest as possible or if he just didn't foresee what it was going to sound like to her but she hears loud and clear basically i lied to your face and toyed with your emotions when you were supposed to trust me and really like took out all of my private frustrations and difficulties on you and honestly that's not the kind of person that you want as a partner he's going through some shit like that was real you know but if every time somebody goes through a dark period they decide to completely reject you and make it clear they don't really want you in their lives the way you want to be in the that's not a healthy coping mechanism and it's not fair to expect people to just accept that, oh, well, you know, one of my dark moods and then forgive you for it. People are also going through their own moods and, and difficulties and you don't get to just do whatever the fuck and there's no consequences. So the fact that she is angry with him for this reveal, I didn't see coming, but I really, really like it. And it's nice because it's like out there now that this is what he wants, but there's a super valid reason for her just going, yeah, I don't think so, bro. And I have to say, you know, as much as I have already said that coming up with like reasons to keep people apart for the drama of it can be so frustrating when it's really, really well done. I, I have a hard time arguing with it. And this is a very well done, like her rage at the fact that he thinks he could just be like, I made a mistake and it's all undone. I mean, he really had her planning on a, on a life as a single mom. He had her deciding to give up her. Oh my God. My, my dog can hear me and he's clawing at the window oh my god you guys this is awful um but he had her planning on giving up on the life that she had pictured for herself in the like you know there's the ideal of being married to the person that you love and then having kids with them but she at least had reconciled herself to like okay well we may not have gotten married and we may not have gone through things in the the traditional order but i at least will be married to the father of my child which is a pretty good situation to be in and i can at least readjust my expectations to this only slightly different picture she was willing to just completely give up on that in order to I'm so sorry. Would you just give me a second? Okay, so the fact that Raphael got her to abandon that and plan on doing things as a single mother, even so far as like taking him to court for custody, these were all very drastic measures that she didn't want to do and she felt guilty for taking these steps. And now to find out that all of it, all of these drastic actions she was going to take were because he was throwing a tantrum is basically, you know, like, and I know that's an oversimplification and it's probably like unfairly dismissive, but truly it sort of ties in actually the reaction he had with the way things went on the night that he thought he had slept with that woman when he got set up. Um, he... I don't remember exactly what had happened the episode before, but he gets too drunk. And then when Jane sort of confronts him about it, he says, well, I had a really hard day. And she comes back with, yeah, 
there are going to be a lot of hard days and sort of calls him on the fact that like you can't just escape into isolation and alcohol because you had a bad day and keep that pattern up and think that's a healthy way to cope. I hope you are aware there's bigger, badder days ahead. We're going to have a kid and it's only going to get harder. And if you can't handle days like this without drinking until you almost pass out, I don't know how you're going to cope then. So seeing that conversation and her sort of like alarm bells going off with the way that he tried to defend himself and then his reaction here to everything, it makes a lot of sense actually with his character that his instinct is to kind of like flee the situation. That's who he is, I guess. And he has been uh, like allowed to do that throughout a lot of his life. He also tells her, and I, this was something that I don't know if I picked up on it at the time, but he says that meeting his mother and finding out how awful she was kind of caused him to overcorrect and start to completely, uh, what's the word I want? He began to turn his father into like a heroic figure in his mind and wanted to live up to his father's legacy when it wasn't a great legacy. His father was not a good father. He wasn't really even a good person. And yet it was simply the fact that his father wasn't his mom. His father was the one who stayed and that was enough for him to like feel this sense of loyalty that wasn't earned. And I don't think I quite clocked that that was what was going on at the time. I think I even said something about like, I don't understand why he is getting so defensive of his father when he has even said how difficult things were with him and how his dad didn't really like even like him or support him. Now, you know, we can, we all can sort of rewrite history when somebody dies. It depends on the type of person you are, but there are, it's a well-documented thing that once someone dies, a lot of folks start to speak about them in terms so much more glowing than they ever used to describe that person while they were still alive. So I think I had just sort of taken it as now that he's dead, you don't get to say bad shit about him. But it being a reaction to his mother had never occurred to me. And I think also... I was very hung up on the fact that like his father offered her the money to stay away and she took it and he just blamed his mom for taking it, but he didn't blame his dad for offering it, which I found sort of surprising, you know, I don't know. I don't remember what it was she did. If, if we know what she did that caused him to go, okay, you know what? I'm just going to give you money to disappear. But I could, I would be willing to accept that it, she hadn't even done anything that dramatic that he just was like, I don't really want to deal with you anymore because he's a control freak and he would want to get any sort of, you know, factor out of the equation that wasn't going to do exactly what he needed it to do. So anyway, that, uh, the, the scene with Raphael just did not go how I expected. She is so upset and I actually really liked this turn of events because she feels like she's been toyed with, which she kind of has. I don't care whether he thought he was doing the right thing or not. So then we have her changing and it's the morning. She is going out for her interview and Michael turns up and he also wants to apologize, but he actually is refreshingly candid here. And he says, look, Raphael accused me of wanting more. And you know what I said, that I do want more. I respect if that's not what you want. But is it not what you want? Because I, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm the only one that feels what's been going on lately, that there is something happening with us. And she says, you're not imagining it, but I don't know where it's coming from. And I mean, there's so much in the air 
And with you, it's safe and familiar. And when she says that, he says, oh, wow, safe and familiar, huh? And she says, I didn't mean it like that. And he says, you know what? To be clear, I, I don't want to be your safe choice, the reality to Raphael, the fantasy. If I am, if that's how it is or how you feel at all, then tell me because I'm not interested. And she just sort of nods and he also nods and says, well, good luck with your interview. And he takes off. I have a lot to say about this little scene. So first of all, I want to say I understand why Michael took it the way that he did. There is nothing flattering about being told you are the stable, reliable, dependable one out of all the other, you know what I mean? Like you can try and frame it however you want, but when you, when you use those sorts of words, you are making it sound like that person is the square and everybody else are the actual fun ones, but you know that the person's always just going to be sitting there waiting for you to come back to when you're tired of dealing with the drama of the others. Like there's just a, a, you know what I mean? I actually had this happen with my ex-husband one time. There was a uh, line in Song of Ice and Fire and I can't remember who says it. It might have been um, Barristan Selmy talking to da Daenerys. But I think he says something about how women always, like young women, go for men who are like fire. And fire is attractive and fire is exciting, but fire burns and it can hurt you and it's unpredictable and it's difficult. And then there are men who are like the opposite, exact opposite, where they are mud. And they are the people that you build with. And you can, you know, plant crops in mud, you can build homes from mud, you can create things. But mud isn't exciting. And it's not romantic. It's practical and necessary and crucial but it doesn't hold the attraction. And I remember reading this and being like, oh my God, because this is how I feel about you, babe. And I feel like you take it the wrong way. And he once again took it the wrong way. But I freely admit that the wrong way is like, it's me saying, it's silly that you took it that way. When really there's not a, there's not another way to take it you know it just it's not flattering sounding and even if it's true you just don't frame it like this so i just wanted to say out of the gate i understand why michael kind of hit the brakes and was like wait a second wait a second now that said what she said about being with you is safe and familiar. Dude, the girl is pregnant. You know, like she's pregnant and being with somebody that feels safe and familiar and that being attractive to her right now is so deeply understandable. It's like basically biological and men try and use biology as a way to completely escape the responsibility of their actions all the time in a way that I find truly infuriating. But here goes the time where I feel like the biology of the situation actually is very much the reality and that he needs to consider it in a serious way. She is about to give birth to a child and she does not have a stable male figure in her household that she feels like she can depend on. And you are somebody that she already has very deep feelings for that. The possibility of you being together is hovering in the air and building a home with her is still possible. Of course, 
she is going to be gravitating towards you right now. And that's just to a degree, not her fault. You know, she is searching for a sense of stability in the midst of a fucking terrifying situation, frankly. And you keep inserting yourself into her life with calls to the familiar, things that you know, like that you have together from your first relationship. You're exploiting that connection to her, but then blaming her for acknowledging it, you know, which is just really, really unfair. You can't simultaneously suggest going to dinner at this place that you guys had your first date all those years ago and then be like, oh, wow. So I'm just familiar. Like, yeah, dude, that's kind of your main advantage right now, actually. So if you don't like that, you could stop pressing that button yourself anytime you want. And I don't see you doing that. You're leaning into it. So I get that you don't want to be compared with Raphael in that sense. But like safe and familiar isn't an inherently bad thing. And safe also, she could mean that in just a, a really literal sense. When you hear the word safe, what people mostly think is you are being extra cautious and refusing to take any risks because you're going for a sure thing. But what she means by safe could also apply to the very real danger that Raphael's associates have posed to her and the baby because there has been actual danger there. And it's, you know, considering that he has been like lead detective on a lot of this, I want him to think about that factor as well. That when she's talking about safety, she's talking about a really material practical aspect of it and not just like the safety of knowing you'll always be there ready to accept whatever scraps I throw to you so anyway I just I I really like that whole conversation because the way he reacted there's a part of me that understood it but I also was just like you're being kind of dishonest right now man and also not really extending a lot of grace and compassion to a woman who has really been through it and has remained impossibly patient and reasonable, frankly, throughout a, a period of her life that would have been scary anyway. And also she's going through wild hormonal fluctu fluctuations, which really the show has not leaned into as much as it could have. Uh, and I am not really mad about it, but I did think we were going to see a little bit more of like how much pregnancy can affect your moods and your outlook and the baby's here and we're not doing that. So, okay. So anyway, Jane winds up, uh, she goes to this interview. She begins to go into labor. She's freaking out. She finally manages to like leave because at first she's attempting to quell the Braxton Hicks contractions because that's what she's sure they are. And the longer this conversation goes on, the clearer it is that she's really in labor. So there's nobody around and she has to take the bus and they get stuck in traffic. She's on the phone with her mother and eventually everybody on the bus is alerted to the fact that she is in labor. The woman who is behind her, it's a black woman who's helping her off the bus she looks so familiar and I do not know where I know her from. But as soon as I saw her sitting behind Jane in a wide shot, I was like, who is that? I know her from something. I bet she's going to have lines because she's definitely somebody. And yeah, she plays a little bit more of a role. I can't remember what her name is. It's like Brianna. Or it's something with a B. Um, but yeah, she gets on the phone with Shamara and they agree that she really needs to go to the hospital they wind up handing the driver, the bus driver, the phone with Shamara. And she says, when I was pregnant with Jane, I went from eight minutes apart to delivering in an hour. Jane is now five minutes apart. Do you want her to have a baby on that bus? And everybody on the bus is in agreement. Let's just get her to the hospital, which I love because 
this is really like the sort of thing that you take for granted happening in a show. But stop and think about how many people on a bus at any given time have like appointments to get to jobs, you know, like, and agreeing to do a complete detour so that she can get to the hospital. Unfortunately, a lot of people wouldn't be so like kind and supportive about it. So I really appreciated that. We're just going to go with everybody is being nice and they're just going, yeah, let's do what's right for this lady, you know? And eventually we get to the hospital and they all cheer for her as she gets off the bus um, and when she is, they, they eventually give her an epidural and I love that they are monitoring the contractions on a, uh, uh, screen because she can no longer feel the epidural or she can no longer feel the contractions. It's just some other like sensor that can tell them that it's happening. And there's a scene in crazy ex-girlfriend as well, where one of the people goes into labor and is very quiet in her room playing Candy Crush. And somebody comes in and is like, huh, I expected you to be like screaming and in pain. That's what it always looks like on TV. And she says, yeah, most of those shows were written by men. So I like this because it feels like sort of an acknowledgement that uh, we've got a, a, a woman who's really going through a more realistic labor due to the fact that this is a show like by and about women. And I don't know if that's even true, you know, with crazy ex-girlfriend it was because Rachel Bloom was so integral to that show, but I don't know about the writing on this show. I don't think I've ever even checked. I don't like to look into things too much because you get spoilers in really weird places. So anyway, that little moment just made me laugh a little bit. Um, so her and it turns out her and Raphael have not decided on a name and they when I say name, I mean first name, which they eventually get to Nina, which I do like, but it turns out she's having a boy, so it doesn't matter. And they had never discussed until now what the baby's last name is going to be. She has been assuming Villanueva and he has been assuming Solano. They agree to hyphenate. And I... <laughs> He says, I'm willing to negotiate. I will make, take the middle position, which we both recognize is the inferior position. But I will need 50% less anger from you. I know it's a big ask, but keep in mind, this was my only sample. So I am giving up the chance to pass down my family's name, which we now know is not true. I am kind of wondering... If he thinks this is his only sample, how could there be more than one that they don't know about? How does that even work? I don't know. But anyway, she says, okay. And he's like, mm, I'm not really buying it. And she's is saying, I don't want to fight with you, but the way you broke up with me sucked. And, you know, I still think it was a good thing that you did it. We want different things from life and your business takes priority. And he finally tells her about how he didn't go to that meeting because she was dilated and that they sold the company and he's taking a payout for it. Like all of these pretty big shifts he's made in his priorities. And I will say you know, at the time I was sort of like, I don't see why you're staying, but now him having this as ammunition, I'm going to say, even though I know that's not really kind, but it is kind of what's happening. Um, it's very convenient for him. So yeah, this leads to, oh, there's a whole thing with Michael and his ex, uh, partner showing up. This is actually a really fun thing. His ex-partner, oh, okay. Rowan says, I think they said they split his original sample in two at the clinic. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, she turns up and wants to try and make a deal. And she says that she knows who the plastic surgeon was who worked on Rose. And this would be the only person who knows what Rose's new face looks like. And she is willing to give this guy up in exchange for a deal to keep her family safe and find leniency for her. 
And Michael agrees to this if what they look into works out. They go to the place that she has said, and he is dead already. So that's kind of a wash on her information, and he doesn't have anything else to offer her. So, but he also doesn't want to, like, just, you know, like, try and get something false and, like, give her an easy time because he's pissed at her. And he thinks that the rest of his cronies are going to be pissed, too. So he frames it as I'm going to like cuff you to this file cabinet and then I, Oh, unexpectedly have to leave. And it's very believable in the moment. I definitely bought it, but his cuff keys are right there, like in reach if she just wriggles a little and she gets away while he's gone, which you think at the time is like bad news for him. But then it turns out this was all part of a play and there's a tracker in the keys or in something, I think. And she is guaranteed to like go back to Sin Rostro's people. So they're just going to follow her and she'll lead them right where they need to go, which I'm really curious if that's actually going to work out because she has freely said that she hasn't had contact with Sin Rostro directly. I am not certain how much, her coming over to Michael's flew under their radar. Like, you know, was she actually able to give them a slip or are they just biding their time because now they know she's a traitor? Like a lot of things could be going on here, but so that's, what's going on with Michael. Uh, Jane starts to go into labor for serious and her mom isn't able to show up until the very last second, but she's there for her and repeats a lot of the same things that her, that her mother said to her when she was in labor and then the baby comes and Jane is so perfectly happy. And it's really sweet. You guys, a lot of times babies being born, those like scenes and movies and TV shows and stuff don't really do a lot for me. And it can be a combination of like the baby has been an annoyance or the pregnancy has been like an annoyance in the storyline or felt really convoluted or, you know, like there's all kinds of ways that you can do a pregnancy storyline really badly. And I think that that has often influenced the way that I have felt, but because the story is about the pregnancy and because Jane is a genuinely good person that I know cares, the reaction she has to this baby is so sweet and seeing everybody just gathered around and they get a baby that really does look like he's just been born. He's even got like the skin sloughing thing in some early scenes like they get when they are first born. It just some the kind of like newborn that you don't see on television a lot of the time. And it turns out they're naming the baby Mateo, which I love that name. And it turns out it's her grandfather's name. Mateo Gloriano Rogelio Solano Villanueva. A lot of names. As somebody who didn't even get a middle name, I could take a name or two. I'll take it. You know, just spread it around. Um, and Rogelio is so delighted. You named him after me. And she says, it's in there, but we're just going to call him Mateo. And he says, yeah, we'll see how nicknames develop. Mateo, perhaps? And honestly, guys, that got to me. That was adorable. Matelio, perhaps. He's so sincere. Bless him. What a little goober. It's a really sweet moment. And uh, eventually, we have the terrible scene. So I'll just give Michael one last moment. He comes in and he he says about before, I just wanted to say, I don't want you to worry about any of that right now. You just focus on Mateo. And this is exactly what she wants to hear. So he says he's going to head out. It's a nice little moment. Then we get her giving the baby to a nurse who says, we had, we didn't get a chance to do his hearing test. Uh, 
I'll take him. It'll be 10 minutes, no needles, just a high-pitched sound. Take a quick nap. He'll be right back. So she takes the baby, and it's all looking normal. But the fact that the camera is still on her kind of made me go, what are, what, what are we, what's, uh, what's happening? What are we doing? Where are we, what are we, what? And she snips the thing off of the baby's ankle and then puts him under a jacket and then sneaks him out the door and hands him over to a glamorous woman in four inch heels. We are told it's in Rostro. Sinrostra takes the baby and drives away. I do not know what the fuck to think is coming next. Genuinely blindsided entirely. Never even entered my mind. And I'm pretty excited about it. I'll be honest because like, because I care about this baby in a way that I haven't before, I'm having a much better reaction, like spoilers for Sons of Anarchy, but that was a show that I was like somewhat into a little bit. And then there was a storyline where his infant son gets abducted and like the whole season is about getting his son back. And I was so bored. It was literally the most boring and I still think of that plot line whenever I think about babies I don't care about in media. That plot line is number one. And so if you had told me, oh, her baby winds up getting abducted, I would have expected to not care. To be like, ugh, really? And instead, I am just like, oh my God, Jane is going to be so upset. She's going to completely lose her shit oh my God, what is everybody going to do? And Michael's going to be even more in her life now. Like I am already really thinking this through. So anyway, I just am really excited about next season. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you again to Claire for commissioning this episode and for your patience in me watching one piece instead. That was my bad. Hope that y'all are enjoying the coverage and until next time to the motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.